So welcome everyone to the meeting. We're going to start in a, just a minute. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, we are a couple of minutes uh, over four, so I think we can start. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the SEDLA uh, series, uh, lecture series. My name is Fabio De Castro. I'm a lecturer uh, at SEDLA in, in environmental issues um, and environmental governance in Latin America. I'll be chairing uh, today uh, this uh, lecture. It, it's a great, great ple pleasure that I, I introduce uh, uh, Professor Eduardo Brundizio today. Uh, today, uh, Eduardo will present uh, the lecture, Transformation to Sustainability in the Amazon, the Role of Place-Based Farming Initiative. Uh, Eduardo Brundizio is a distinguished professor of anthropology at Indiana University in Bloomington and director of the Center for, for the Analysis and Social Ecological Landscapes, as Gazelle is called. Uh, Eduardo has uh, served several international scientific bodies, including the co-chair in uh, between 2016-19 of the Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Eco Ecosystem Service and inter of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, so IPBS. Uh, he's also a member of the Scientific Science, Science Committee of the Future Earth Program. And he has recently become a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, he's a leading uh, researcher in, in several issues on, on human environmental interaction, social environmental challenge, changes in, Latin, in, in, in the Amazon. And he has coordinated several international research uh, projects in the region. So one of the, his current projects is AGENTS, which uh, is the project that he's going to say a little bit to tell us a little bit about uh, the, the, the research. So Eduardo uh, will give a short presentation and uh, we invited uh, Dr. Antonio Yoris uh, to be the discussant of the lecture today. Um, Antonio Yoris, uh, Dr. Antonio Yoris is a reader uh, in human geography at Cardiff University in UK and he has carried out several research projects uh, in, in, in publishing numerous articles on indigenous geography uh, political ecology and agribusiness-based development in Brazilian Amazon and the Cerrado. So we have two very interesting uh, uh, scholars, uh, and I'm very excited to, to hear both of you. So I would first give the floor to Eduardo. Eduardo. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, thank you all of you for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you in advance, Antonio, uh, for, for commenting and participating. It's an honor. Um, so, uh, I'm going to do more of a reflection rather than a very, you know, structured lecture with a key point. It's more like a, a reflection and a tour uh, uh, on my perspective, coming from both working at the global level and working at a regional level. Um, and then, so contextualize this within the context of the Two of the projects that, that I have been, you know, working a lot for the past uh, few years, uh, the global assessment, which we finished in 2019, uh, and the agents project in which Fabio and many colleagues who are here are partner PIs, uh, and it has been, I think, one of the most fun projects to work with uh, in the recent years. I'm kind of starting by giving a contextualization uh, of, of, of the presentation with the global assessment um, to look exactly at this intersection between the process that are happening globally and the transformation that are happening globally um, 
in the transformations, how that relates to transformations that are regional. Uh, so one thing that, I, you know, it's interesting when you work at the global level is the kind of sovereign picture that you get on the scale of changes that have taken place. This is just during the past 50 years, you know, so we have reconfigured this planet in many ways. Um, and when we look at, you know, indicators of basically ecological indicators of all kinds of indicators of our dependence on nature, they're all under decline. Uh, now, there's an enormous regional variation and inequality into the benefits and the burdens of this process. And I think when we work on the ground in a region like the Amazon, you get a sense uh, of you know, how these transformations are playing out in different regions and also um, their inequality of the distribution of burdens, but also how people are reacting at different levels. Um, so one of, the, one of the interesting things that you see when you take a, a global perspective is that on the one hand, like in the previous slide, you have this you know, incredibly um, uh, drastic image of the, 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 the environmental crisis and, and inequality and climate crisis at the global level. When you evaluate uh, you know, the agreed goals, in this case, you're seeing here the, the 20 biodiversity goals for this decade that passed, the, the, the IG biodiversity targets, there's a, a really conflicting picture that emerges. And that conflicting picture is that, you know, when you look at an evaluation on the aggregates, um, you have this, big, this, this idea, this image that we have failed and that we are failing uh, as countries and as societies to meet and to address the, the, those issues that we uh, are facing. And that's the general narrative that you get at a global level, whether you're talking about climate, whether you're talking about the IG targets, the biodiversity targets, whether you're talking about the progress to the sustainable development goals so far. You know, for instance, in the same, the global assessment, um, we, our scenarios, that we, the scenarios that we evaluated and the indicators that we evaluated, you know, show that we are, for instance, on a, you know, on the track to miss about 80% of the sustainable development goals that you know have a more close relationship to the environment. So we get this picture uh, of the, the, the scale of the crisis and the failure of society to address those issues. The other way that I like to look at it, uh, you know, and sort of digging a little bit behind this global aggregate picture is actually to see how much reaction how much, how many initiatives, how many efforts, you know, at all levels that you find confronting those issues. So you actually can create a different narrative if you look at where we made some progress or where progress has been made in some regions, but not aggregated at a global level. And I think that, you know, that's one perspective that, that I, I try to bring in a narrative that I try to bring to the global assessment to show the importance of, of all these reactions, as I said, at all level confronting those issues uh, and look at how, you know, how they are making a difference and what is limiting them uh, to you know, scale up and to have a, uh, an impact that is uh, more global. And that I think is one of the contexts in which I think about the agents projects as we're going to see. You know, it, it's when you look at the Amazon, you have the similar reality of a process that, you know, it's a region in incredible transformation facing enormous amount of crisis, but at the same time, you know, it's a region where you see the sort of cradle of innovations, of initiatives, of efforts, of alliances to confront this crisis. So you have this dissonant picture, both at a global level, you know, on the scale of change and the failure of the society, or at a regional level where you see this kind of concerning trends, uh, but also the reactions to that. Now, I think it's important to enter to this from a global perspective, because the larger story here is a long-term development story. That's not only a development story of the Amazon in this case, but that's part of a global development story that hasn't changed hardly during the past 50 or 70 years. 
these figures are, you know, it's a bit difficult to interpret, but it basically shows different kinds of indicators of trajectories, whether it's economic trajectories or consumption trajectories, extraction of biomass, also protected areas, pollution, and, um, you know, the benefits that that uh, economy gets from, uh, from biodiversity, for instance, and across different uh, levels of income for countries. And if you pay attention, you see that it has hardly changed the pattern of distribution of these trends. You know, so you have a process of development that has been moving around the world, um, you know, in an economy that is growing and trade that is going very rapidly, segregating production from consumption, displacing environmental burdens, uh, you know, in this continuous process of a moving frontier. So it's, I think it's really important to see also the Amazon, we see in this context of a global uh, development trajectory that, you know, follows this kind of past dependency uh, for quite a, a long time. And that has very different kinds of benefits uh, in, in bird, the distribution of burdens and benefits. And I, I see the Amazon or, or argue that the Amazon is a microcosm of that development pattern of, of that both the global scale of transformation acceleration to use the great acceleration uh, idea, but also the Amazon as a global front in the global political economic frontier of resource extraction and, you know, and, and, and development as we all know. So seeing this region you know, from part of a global political economy to have that long-term historical development uh, picture, uh, you know, to understand what's, what's going on today. The other side where I'm coming from, you know, where many of our colleagues in the agent projects, uh, I think all of us in the agent projects come from, is from looking at these changes and understanding these transformations from uh, the bottom up. You know, basically trying to see those transformations uh, as experienced by the families and the communities that for most of us, you know, have been following for a long time. And it gives that, you know, sense of, uh, as you see for the agents project, you know, of uh, many different kind of waves of development ideas of conditions that have enabled families to make decisions in different ways, to react to this regional and national transformations, to find different alternatives and different forms of coping with this process and to search for different opportunities. And so that's the, the perspective that I'll you know, bring and, and try now to, um, that we bring, I think, to the ages projects, um, but we see seen also this larger uh, global and regional perspective. So the way I conceptualize it and to situate you in other pieces of my own research, trying to make sense and understanding this transformation uh, is to a process that I you know, end up calling for the, the lack of a better term, uh, a grounded complex systems perspective. You know, and by that, I mean that you know, we're looking into this transformation as a process of, of structuration between this uh, larger scale process, many centralized decisions, many processes that are way beyond the region with how they interact on the ground and how people respond to those interactions that eventually help to transform um, the larger system as well. So trying to look at this process from both angles, uh, but the, look at the transformation at, at the intersection of national development trajectories at a global political economy of resource, but also on the ground actions reacting to that. And the global, uh, the, com the complex system perspective, you know, is one that tries to look at this process as part of an interlinked set of networks uh, in social ecological changes, you know, that are, have been transforming the region uh, in that are creating, to use a complex system language, you know, emergent nonlinear transformations in the landscape. Uh, so I usually have this slide uh, in which I present this kind of four areas of work to look at regional transformation as a process that is at the interplay between local decisions, local actions and regional uh, more structural processes. And I usually go through each example here, each of the four corners to illustrate concretely with empirical work, you know, how 
this perspective at least has helped me to make sense of what I see on the ground, that noisy, that kind of very diverse reality that I see on the ground and the patterns that have been emerging uh, from those interactions you know, with process. So I started here uh, with the acai uh, economy, which I have been studying for over 30 years, you know, through the process of expansion regionally and the process of uh, globalization of the process. So when we see that, I started studying this very much from uh, the producer's perspective, you know, trying to understand how in the, during the 1980s, the market for acai started to grow in the region and local farmers started to respond with using their own knowledge to intensify an agroforestry system to respond to a growing market. That process was a, you know, very, um, um, a, a very uh, uh, distributed process for the lack of a better term in the sense that you know, these were individual farmers and family groups responding to market opportunities changing their land use decision, switching from shifting cultivation to intensive agroforestry systems. And it's a process that over time has led to the transformation of entire landscapes of the Amazon estuary to become the dominant land use that emerged from individual decisions you know, to external signals. And that, that those decisions led to an emergent change in the landscape to become one of the most important production system in the region. The other side of this equation is that, you know, farmers in, in particular, these groups of farmers, you know, continue to be marginal in a supply chain that aggregates values to a very valuable product proportionally distant to the region of production. So you have the situation where farmers have engaged and engendered a whole transformation of a production area and a whole economy in, res in responding individually to that, increase their economic opportunity significantly, but is still uh, not benefiting and not being able to capture the richness of this economy you know, proportional to its size. That process has other implications along with other transformations in the regions, in particular, transportation since 2000, communication since about 2000 and some, and electricity that allowed families to reorganize themselves as economic units and to respond to these constraints, uh, which are many, which are not going in detail here, by reorganizing their families between rural areas where they can have a secure production of a, a variable valuable fruit uh, and all other resources, but also a place in the city uh, where they can have access to service, where kids can go to school, uh, where they look for economic niches and, and take opportunities of, of those economic niches. So the other side of it, if you go to the, the left corner, lower corner here, is that what we observe as part of that process is also a process of reorganization of families into what we call multi-sited families and multi-sited uh, households, in which decision and those various processes allow families to expand and to be part of the urban landscape. So on the other hand, you have a process because of other structural changes in Brazil that led to a very widespread urbanization grid. That has to do with both the constitution in 1988 that changed the ability of, of for municipalities to be created and new urban areas to be created. So that's one way you can look at the urbanization of the region. But what I'm arguing, what I argue in this analysis uh, is that the, when you look at the immense urbanization of the Amazon is as much a process of individual family decisions as on the basis of what I just explained and as much of a regional transformation, you know, that facilitated the expansion of urban areas. So looking at urban areas also as part of an emergent process in which individual family decisions, investment in, in houses in urban areas along with many other issues, you know, it helped to understand the, the, the scale of expansion, but also the precarity of urban areas and the problems that they're facing now in terms of all sorts of problems, vulnerability to many kinds of, of, um, of flooding and other things. 
you know, violence and, and all sorts of issues. So you know, basically the, the federal decision, and then you have also the same decision interacting with, uh, you know, the expanding urban areas and reorganization of families. And then more broadly, if you go to the top uh, upper corner, you know, this is part of a regional transformation of the, the, the interurban infrastructure, the connections between urban areas, the roads that are connecting areas that were disarticulated before, um, and process, you know, that have facilitated that those, those, um, this transformation to grow and to ex continue to expand today uh, regionally. And which is part of another process of the regional reorganization of property rights and the emergence of different kinds of territorial governance at the intersection of this expanding infrastructure, expanding agricultural frontiers in sort of, uh, you know, the, the complexification uh, of the institutional arrangements of the regions that is part of this mesh of network that I'm kind of trying to convey in words here for you. I usually do this visually you know, so you see what I'm talking about, but I hope you kind of follow the idea of understanding the region as part of this interactive process that continues to move uh, and continues to produce outcomes that are very nonlinear uh, in their, you know, their process and, and very hard to understand in many ways. So I want to offer, you know, this is starting point to also to contextualize where I'm coming from in thinking about, uh, you know, as we get to this wonderful, project and wonderful group of people that is part of the, the agents project. Um, so the agents project is part, and I think I forgot some of the names here of our colleagues, I apologize for that. The agents project <clears throat> is part of a, a large uh, international network of funding in the program of transformation to sustainability of North Face and Belmont Forum and brings together, you know, this group of colleagues all of, of you know with experience in the region or in this kinds of, of issues uh, to look at you know what our initiatives local initiatives uh, playing a role in this very complex transforming region uh, you know where all those interactions are you know developing uh, as we speak so I'll briefly uh, give an overview uh, of the project um, and some of the, the the issues that we are addressing, but we're you know basically our 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 kind of center of attention in this project is to look at those place-based initiatives, what people are doing on the ground, uh, how people are responding, and to what extent those responses you know, are able, uh, based to sustain and also you know to scale up and to make a difference in people's lives and in people's landscapes. So we're asking questions about how those initiatives emerge, sustain, transform landscapes and socioeconomic uh, conditions. Um, how those, uh, you know, how they form alliance, how do they emerge uh, and amplify those initiatives through collaborations uh, and networks? Uh, what factors may help to facilitate or limit uh, those initiatives to, to achieve what they intend and how different kinds of initiatives are interacting. Uh, which is a, a, a really interesting aspect that we see today in the region, you know, following a history of a very sectoral kinds of uh, uh, interventions or initiatives or efforts, you know, to, to uh, processes that are more uh, cross-sectoral. And uh, we basically end up defining the scope of where we look and, and how we look to focus on initiatives that are place-based. Um, and that may be, maybe they were initiated by certain intervention or, or a combination of certain and internal interventions, you know, but they are, you know, localized. They, they are intended to make a difference in a place. Um, we, you know, people that have an ownership of those initiatives take the risks of implementing them, take the challenge of implementing them, but may be part of a very large scale uh, of networks of collaborators, of institutions, of movements, of organizations that are actually shaping uh, those things. So, you know, in, in many cases, they also are, represent already emergent organizations, emergent networks um, in the region. We're looking to that um, now in uh, three main regions in themselves, complex, large, and, you know, very, um, uh, 
interesting in many ways uh, that more or less along the segment from the Amazon Estuary and the Acara Valley um, to the Santarém, uh, to the, the, the region between Tapajós and Xingu and the Amazon and the Trans-Amazon to the region of the tri-frontier um, in, in Peru, uh, Bolivia, and, and, and Brazil, in the state of Acre. So those are the three areas. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention just the approach that we've been taking, which have been kind of significantly affected by the pandemic. But the project, the project team, uh, you know, the approach that we have is first is a participatory approach with many of the, the, the key questions of the project, the key emphasis and how we decide on, on to focus on what we're focusing now, emerged uh, from uh, this uh, dialogue workshops in field work that you know, allow us to have and to, to, to have more focal uh, questions uh, and ideas. Um, it has been sort of a, a really, a really uh, you know, nice, refreshing, motivating, encouraging process to work with the organizations, you know, with uh, people on the ground as part of the beginning of this process. And we have, on the other hand, a geospatial platform to organize, to evaluate, and try to access, assess the impact of those initiatives, and a database of initiatives, which I'll mention in a second, uh, you know, that is very detailed, uh, and it's sort of, uh, sort of getting us to think, uh, you know, how can we uh, you know, understand different dimensions, have a comparative perspective where, it, where it's uh, applied, um, and also have a framework that allows us to, to grow over time, you know, in, 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 in understanding the role of, of initiatives in the region as a whole. Um, I'm not going to talk about the day because of the time, just, just give some, some hints to, to the project. We have produced uh, several reports as part of this process, which is a way also to give back and to, you know, return and to document those initiatives in a way that can be used. Um, by uh, the collaborators on the ground. Um, and now with the, the pandemic, uh, a lot of effort has been put, you know, on the one hand on the database coordinated by Marina Londres uh, and a group of, of, of the students. Uh, you know, it's a very large database. They're working very hard in trying to interview, populate, do research on each one of the initiatives. We've so far over 200 initiatives in, in over 900 localities and 174 municipalities. And on the other hand, uh, Christian Anderson and uh, Adriana Molina Gasson have organized a whole series of dialogue workshops uh, in Peru, um, you know, to continue this process of interaction and in, in building this collaboration uh, during this time, this, this, this difficult time um that we are on this is uh, these are the kinds of initiatives that we've been uh been working on as you see you know it's a combination of initiatives that have to do with production systems um, many of them um with uh, agriculture and forest management and fisheries production system uh, initiatives that are aimed at um value aggregation Many initiatives that are aimed to improve market access and you know conditions for um, uh, for bet better value aggregation and, and, and benefits of the, the local production, force management, uh, certification, non forest timber products, and an incredible array of micro industries and initiatives that is you know I think one of the most fascinating parts of it uh, that are trying to you know to to. But on the ground, you know, to overcome this structural limitation of the region, you know, which is uh, in terms of providing access and opportunities, uh, market opportunities for local producers. Um, now, back to our, you know, to the, 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 the idea of looking from this from a historical perspective, you know, what, what we've been trying to, to do is to contextualize what is emerging today as part of a, re, uh, a, 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 a history of transformation and, and development ideas, development paradigms that have shaped the Amazon during the past 50 years. So we contextualize and try to understand these initiatives you know, as part of a process um, and a conflicting process of development uh, ideas. And you know, on one hand, the, 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 this continues up and down of state-based developmentalism in the Brazilian Amazon. 
um, the importance of uh, what we call transnational social environmentalism during a period of about you know 15 years or so that shaped many of those initiatives today. And now more recently, the emergence of market-based um, programs. And one of the things that was interesting working at this level and with these types of initiatives, is it's really to reflect back on what many of us have followed over decades in the Amazon, you know, which is the, the role of what we end up calling enabling and enablers um, that have shaped the political organization, the visions, the ability to cooperate, the alliances that are behind these initiatives today. And that has, uh, on the one hand, you know, be, besides other factors, um, the liberation theology movement and the base education movement from the 70s to the 80s that had an enormous impact and it was sort of abruptly ended with the transition in, in the Brazilian clergy of, of, of the Catholic Church, but had a, it still has today an incredible impact, uh, I would say, in how local organizations are functioning and, and organizing politically, their political voice. The PPG-7 program, the, the, the large conservation of tropical forest program that, you know, one of the most impactful programs, both in local initiatives, in really direct on the ground intervention, but also in shaping the Brazilian environmental policy, the Brazilian and the, the Amazonian monitoring system, you know, and the creation of, of conservation areas, sustainable use areas and, and indigenous areas, and incredibly important. And then a, a number of a bundle of social, social environmental policies that although this continued much after 2010 or so, you know, continue to have an impact. So we try to look at those initiatives also as, as part of this, uh, you know, long-term history of interactions, of interventions, ideas, and paradigms. Not going to go into detail here, you know, but uh, many kinds of initiatives that had either facilitated or actually limited, impaired, or you know, sort of uh, confronted those initiatives on the ground. So the, the point here is that we're trying to look at how they're working today as part of a historical process and as part of a process, you know, that uh, is shaped. Uh, by waves and up and downs of enthusiasm, you know, of a syndrome of pilot projects that is start and, you know, people mobilize it and they fail and disappear. Uh, all sorts of experience in creating alliance, political groups, you know, social movements, uh, confronting, uh, you know, those hardships uh, and, you know, trying to keep and to find new ideas and solutions um, for problems going forward. And you see, when you look at, this is partial, uh, part of the database, uh, and you look at the, you know, when those initiatives emerge and you see, you know, how important those programs that I just mentioned have been, you know, in shaping, promoting, creating the conditions, facilitating financing. Um, so you see here, you know, the strands uh, of programs, particularly doing, you know, the, the, the late 1990s and, and about, you know, Sort of until now, but you have this, this incredible increase until uh, a few years ago. Uh, and now new kinds of initiatives are emerging, new kinds of alliances and ways of confronting those issues are emerging. They cover a number of things. There are different ways that we can use this database. And here's another way that you can you know, think about the groupings of initiatives from uh, all sorts of productivity or an agricultural production and, um, and restoration. Uh, uh, associations, cooperatives, uh, inter-associations, confederations, so a number of alliances that emerge as, as to support local initiatives, um, different kinds of micro industries, as I said, and a number of uh, other um, uh, sort of events, uh, uh, actions that we, we have in the database. So I'll just give a brief tour and, and then some kind of concluding uh, ideas uh, about it. So you have a sense on the ground, you know, what is, uh, what is taking place. These are wonderful maps prepared by uh, Diana Thurn um, that locate and, you know, give us a sense that while very place-based, you know, these initiatives are manifested uh, regionally. Uh, and, and that's, you know, one of the, the ideas of the, pro one of the goals of the project is really to show the scale and to show the connections, to show the, you know, the, the diversity of initiatives and how they are playing a role uh, regionally. 
our sense is that we have only touched on the tip of the iceberg. You know, you look at other efforts that are looking at specific initiatives, let's say restoration initiatives or um, uh, uh, non-timber forest product initiatives, certification is, you find thousands of initiatives taking place today. It's still mostly invisible, right? But they're out there uh, and, and, and working on the ground. So these are agriculture and agroforestry activities. Um, you see examples of, for instance, recovering and uh, restoring pastures uh, to develop agroforestry systems, uh, community-based um, uh, nurseries in which families can sort of develop their seedlings to produce the agroforest that best fits their needs. And that's, you know, there are hundreds of, of this or over a hundred of these uh, types of, of, of nurseries. Middle scale agroforestry system. This is a um, in Tomeasu, which has become one of the centers of agroforestry diffusion in the region. And you see the, the kind of uh, the scale of agroforestry that in, in this case here, you see very nicely in contrast to a pasture, uh, you know, to very different production system, very different productivity, very different implications. Uh, and in some regions, you know, our, this kind of agroforest systems are, you know, continuing to expand. Um, um, timber related activities, uh, uh, non-timber forest products, which, you know, again, this is just a, a, a tip of the iceberg uh, for these kinds of activities. Um, many activities in that, you know, uh, uh, not, a, not a new, new issue. There are many examples of previous efforts that have tried to aggregate value to develop you know, with small processing factories and, and cooperatives to bring more value to, to products, to local products. But you see now also a new emergence of these kinds of efforts more through the hands of local, uh, local leaders, local associations, then created from the outside and put in the region. So, um, a fisheries, which we haven't put a lot of work on, but is we're trying to also to, to you know, make sure that we document and, and, and cover the kinds of activities that are fisheries based. Uh, and organizations in general, this is a particular map of women's organization uh, and, and groups um, play an incredibly important role in many of those regions and in, in, uh, in a number of ways. Yeah, so that's a, a brief tour. And what we are, you know, looking uh, as, as we explain this paper is, you know, both the kinds of initiatives in themselves and what, what role they're playing, how they are achieving and helping to achieve different types of goals, whether it's to improve production, whether to, you know, develop a, a resource management system that is more sustainable. Um, then you know you have the value aggregation and market initiatives that in themselves have enormous values but are uh, um, are closely connected to to production areas and then you know supporting all sorts of governance initiatives that you know are both developing uh, institutions for managing resources and in um, develop you know resource governance to organizations, inter, inter associations, confederations, uh, all sorts of initiatives that are trying to uh, develop uh, and, and resync and, and promote governance systems that you know, attend and support local goals. It's a really, you know, one of the challenges that we have uh, in the project is to understand to what extent those initiatives are making a difference, at what level they're making a difference, for whom they're making a difference. And that's one of the, the challenges that we have, a conceptual challenge that we're grappling with. We're trying to look, you know, at some of the outcomes that emerge at the intersection of this process, we call synergistic outcomes, you know, in way in which initiatives um, allow um, you know sustainable uh, transitions uh, in production systems as an outcome of those efforts. Into in what way they create larger landscape transformation. In some region, we see already that some of those initiatives, like the acai in the estuary, um, you know, in, in other areas, have you know really shaped the landscape. In other areas, they remain very isolated. Uh, you know, very surrounded by landscapes that are. Uh, you know, very different than what, what people are trying to create. Change in life standards and well-being, which is uh, also a challenge to understand, but it's, uh, you know, a, a really important goal for most of these initiatives is to change local conditions. 
um, and so forth. You know, the the, the giving voice and, and uh, a, a position on the table, I guess, for initiatives that are trying to, you know, find a place in the region and, and improve their situation. So we kind of try to look at how they're interacting. We're in the middle of this process. Um, just a, a final reflection, I think, you know, we, we have learned a lot uh, in terms of the conditions that have facilitated uh, initiatives to succeed, local action, local co collective action to, su to succeed. And I think we have a good understanding of this process, you know, how people negotiate boundaries, how face-to-face -face communication, uh, information, trust facilitates uh, you know, uh, the success of collective action and, and so forth. All the, you know, the, the uh, kind of the, the Austrian tradition of understanding what, you know, allows people to succeed in their effort. And that's an important part of how we, we I think we look at it. On the other hand, you know, you are also in a region where you have all the conditions to undermine these kinds of struggles. You know, the elite capture and the supported elite, elite, elite capture uh, these kinds of distant impacts that, are, uh, that affect uh, initiatives locally, cartels and illegal cartels, you know, that are in fact supported by, uh, in some cases, by the government, uh, and, and that you know creates a huge amount of distrust and violence, and and, uh, and also non-cooperation, free riding, all the kinds of problems that we know, you know, tend to limit uh, the success of these initiatives. And particularly now, you know, you have a, a situation where not only those challenges that we know are always challenges anywhere you are, you know, to engender collective action, but it's happening in a process, you know, where you have, um, you know, kind of re, uh, re, reburn of, of, of the, the, the kind of state developmentalism and frontier mentality, you know, that's creating the situation of conflict, distrust, um, you know, the, the, the denialism and fake news and the information crisis that we live are all posing enormous challenges for the, these initiatives to succeed and to overcome and to, you know, search the, what they want. Eduardo, so, uh, we should uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, so we yeah, yeah, I'm done. This is the last one. So, uh, yeah, the, I think what, what we are, uh, you know, getting to is, is showing that they are having particularly now, uh, a, a very important role in the region, dealing with the problems themselves, try to confront those issues um, uh, on the ground. Um, there are interesting, you know, kind of, of uh, 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 you know, ways in which people are finding to confront this. You see different kinds of networks emerging mobilization and social movement that are bringing groups together that were not together, uh, you know, to confront those problems. But, you know, at the same time, uh, the lack of a larger, in, a larger kind of framework, support for uh, the rule of law, you know, supporting for uh, activities on the grounds, you know, are essential. And, and so you have this disconnect uh, that has become very apparent uh, with the COVID pandemic um, now. So uh, many, uh, it's an ongoing process. I, I don't think we have a, even a grasp on it, how people are responding, reorganizing, trying to find alternatives. Uh, and, you know, there's a moment, a very critical moment of how we respond to this, I think will shape whether they emerge strong and, uh, you know, have a, a change, in, uh, 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 an impact on the region or not. So thank you. That's a, uh, a very quick and very fast overview. So I hope it was was okay. Thank you, Eduardo, very much to try to simplify such a complex situation, complex uh, context in such a short time. It was quite clear and I think uh, very inspiring for many of us. Uh, I think we'll come with some questions. But before we go for those questions, I'd like to invite uh, Antonio Odis uh, to make some to give some reflections on on the presentation, maybe uh, and to to bring some maybe uh, questions for to kick off the discussion. Antonio Odis, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, well, congratulations to Professor Brodizzo. It's, a, it's an honor to be here discussing or, or attending this talk and and taking part in this brief discussion. Uh, so. I think it was an incredible effort to summarize 
uh, a lot of work going on and, and uh, lots of ideas. So that's, that's really impressive. Also, thank you to Dr. Fabio de Castro for the opportunity and congratulations to the whole research team. So it's, it's certainly a very ambitious effort to assess and, and reflect on, on the co-production of knowledge and the search for new sources of income. I know how wonderful and complicated that can be. I had a project some years ago on ecosystems and poverty, also in Pando and in the Santarém area. So I, I, I'm sure you're having a lot of fun. Uh, more importantly, the, the Amazon is certainly a top political priority, not just in, in South America, but a global political priority. That was demonstrated uh, several times by President Biden uh, and the, the, the debate on climate change and, and the regional development. So the Amazon is certainly a very important, very challenging reality, and not just for in terms of biophysical science, but also social science. It's, it's, uh, it's important that more science and more reflection is developed in relation to the Amazon and with the people in the Amazon. I quite like the title of the more recent project, Agents. So to understand agency, including obviously the agency of nature itself. So I think it was a very rich and comprehensive presentation. I would have several, uh, I would have lots of questions and, and points, but obviously uh, more important is to open the floor to the, the questions from the participants. So I'd like to make three quick points or, or, or ask three uh, brief questions, uh, which what, points that were mentioned in the presentation, but uh, uh, per perhaps uh, 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 if possible, I'd like to see some, some additional thoughts, additional ideas. First, uh, it's uh, fascinating to see this work on transformation and acceleration of change. And you are certainly dealing with processes that are profoundly complicated and contested. So associated with macro changes and, and, and micro forms of change and interaction. So my first question would be, how are you dealing with different scales of change? So changes at the local, the national and the regional level. So different scales of spatial change and also socioeconomic change. So you mentioned several times uh, the focus, the place-based focus and also focus on some goods like acai. So is this focus on goods or places uh, an entry point into this, this cross-scale process of change? Uh, second, uh, to what extent the, the research, the, the, the ongoing uh, investi uh, research is provoking on inf or informing new Invest, uh, investigative approaches to cope with a reality that is obviously quite unfair and to, to, to some extent, to a large extent, quite violent. So how, how are you, uh, uh, if, is, to what extent there is a space in the project to come up with new in investigation strategies uh, for example, have you had the chance to discuss agency with the agents in the uh, themselves on the floor? So uh, this concept of agency and agents, ha has it been uh, explored or shared with the participants? And, and has it informed new uh, uh, ideas about research, the practice of research itself? So the first question on scale, the second on, on the new types, new approaches to investigation and, uh, and, and connection with the participants, uh, because there's more and more uh, uh, emphasis on innovation and, and new forms of research. And, and my third point, very briefly, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this as, as quick as I can, is exactly on, uh, I saw in, in some of the recent publications from the agents project, the, 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 the emphasis on innovation. Uh, but my question is innovation in relation to what? In relation to what was known before, so traditional practices and knowledge, or innovation in relation to exogenous techniques, exogenous uh, 
uh, uh, production approaches that are brought to have been brought to the region. So what 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 is innovation in that context? And I think innovation is not a simple word; it's also a contested word. And uh, uh, one 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 common expression, one common tech, uh, tool that uh, has become widespread around the world is this uh, search for market-based conservation strategies like, like the payment for ecosystem services. But I, uh, I, I'm not sure if you had the chance to discuss, to, to explore that in the project because the payment for ecosystem services is, is a very controversial strategy. Just to give an example, last week in a meeting by the, the presidents of the top economies, the only answer that the current president of Brazil had to the, to the, the pressure uh, uh, and the very bad environmental record was to mention the payment for ecosystem services, which I think suggests that, uh, uh, it, it demonstrates that it can be easily appropriated by very reactionary politicians, uh, criminals actually, the current Brazilian president is, is a gangster, is a criminal, is responsible for genocide. And his only rents, uh, the only answer he had to the international community was to make reference to the payment for ecosystem service. So I, 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 would, I, would, I would conclude that the payment for ecosystem services, for example, is a type of innovation that may not be the, 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 the sort of innovation that benefit, genuinely benefit uh, uh, most of the, the, the population on the ground. So very briefly and schematically, so I, I would have many other points, but uh, thank you very much again. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, I, have, I have been learning loads really today. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, uh, yeah, no, just to, to briefly say, Edward, I know that those three questions could be another long uh, uh, lecture. So, but if you can, in a few minutes, uh, try to address uh, some of the points uh, you always raised. Okay, so first, thank you, because this is actually a nice guide for us to think about a paper, to think about, you know, several issues, uh, several questions that were addressed in the project. Very challenging question. I'll say that the first one on the scale of transformation, um, the way I look at transformation in, in the sense of the, the regional transformation is, on the one hand, as I try to say, as, you know, that uh, it's... It, it, uh, don't separate local from regional transformation. Uh, you know, the, that process of emergent uh, uh, systems, you know, in which uh, there, I look at it from this structuration process in which the reactions of individual agents at a very local scale to regional processes end up shaping regional processes themselves. So the example of the Asai economy, for instance, where you have individual decision-making to land use uh, in a process that end up transforming the region as a whole. So you can have both that perspective of the individual farmer and how the farm is transforming, but also what is the aggregate of that transformation in a larger landscape. So that's one way to look at it between the very local place space and the kind of local landscape in which you, you see those transformations. The other level that I look at it are, is to, to use a complex system language is to look at the state shifts in the whole region. And I'll give you two examples of state shifts that we observe regionally. One is the articulation of urban areas. So we, you know, we did an analysis in 2009 uh, one asking, is there an articulation of the regional urban areas between themselves? And at that time, it was very clear there was no articulation between the large urban centers. You have large urban centers with their satellite networks that are dispersed in different parts of the region. You do that analysis today, you have a complete shift in that landscape in which urban areas have become articulated, interconnected physically, and have shaped the landscape of indigenous lands of reserves. And so now you have a different level of transformation of the whole landscape that emerged from this kind of sectoral or sub-regional transformation. Of course, there's not a, a, a clear answer to that, but you know, that's the, the kind of, of, of transformation perspective. One is local, one is then local into the immediate landscape, and one is the larger regional transformation that you know, has been shaped by the emergence of this process more broadly. 
uh, on the agency, uh, whew, uh, okay. Um, I think there's one thing that I think we need, you know, we, we have a wonderful first year of the project where we shape the project through the perspective of our interactions with the collaborators that we have on the ground. We could not return to the field in the second year uh, where I think a lot of the goals was to try to understand, is still to try to understand what are the criteria, what are the ideas, what are the metrics that that, lo that those collaborators use to think about transformation, use to think about improvement, you know, using to think about uh, reaching goals. So I think that's still something we need to do, uh, which is to get those perspectives from the bottom up and say, you know, what, what are the ideas of transformation, how people frame transformation in their own terms so it can help us to understand, you know, uh, on the aggregate of the, the kinds of transformation that we are seeing. In terms of innovation, uh, there's a lot to be talked about that and a lot to talk about, you know, payment for ecosystem service. I'm like, very skeptic of always has been <laughs> of payment for ecosystem service. But what I think in terms of innovation, one of the innovations that I think are the most important ones, I think for many of us, are the, the, the political uh, and the, the agents and the political agents, the political experience that people have gained over time. That's one of the most important innovations because when you look at the same places 10 years ago or 20 years ago, they're much more subjected to external intervention and pilot projects and financing and ideas. And I think today we see a you know, beginning a change in that process in which you know people are much more experienced they take charge they take leadership you know they're thinking differently about how to implement their projects as well i think that's one of the most important innovations uh you know is on the way of thinking and their positionality in relation to external actors that's a i don't know if i responded those are three wonderful questions so yes Thank you, Eduardo. I just want to mention that we're going to stop now the recording. So for the uh, Q&A session, um, and we have a few questions already at uh, the chat. So 